Join us here at The Word is Right. There you go. You got it? Whenever you're ready. Do that again. As you can tell, we're having another night in the sanctuary for Bible study. We do have, we do have uh, the furnace problem, so we're going to have to get that straightened out. We thought we had it fixed, but apparently there's more to it than what we thought. Okay, so here we are. Join us for the, the Word is Right tonight. Yes, not the price is right, but the Word is right. And we're going to come together and we'll just have a good time, okay? God bless you. Oh, okay. thanks, Richard. Okay, so uh, Terry's joined us from Portland, uh, came off work and just got right over here. And he's here with us. Richard uh, joined us over here, too, and he's a working man also. And uh, you know what? These men are giving their quality time and their time period to come and join us, and that's a wonderful thing. Now, there's uh, we've got snacks here in the sanctuary. We don't normally do that. But uh, nobody wants to sit over there at 32 degrees in the fellowship hall. I wonder why. Yeah. So anyway, I think this is a good solution. Now we are at uh, chapter 15. And I like this. This is a great, great place to be studying. And um, let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Richard, would you lead us in prayer? Precious Jesus, thank you for this day. And thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. So we humbly praise you and honor and worship and for all the things that you plan to do on our behalf and we humbly ask the Lord that you be with us as we go through your word and try to understand and learn you more that we can love you better in your son's most holy precious name we give you praise honor and glory in the mighty name of Jesus Amen Amen. so we have the technical difficulties with the furnace so please forgive us for having to start late but uh, better late than never I say Last time we were at 1 Corinthians and we were looking at the necessity of the resurrection because if there's no, if Christ, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? That was verse 12. Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Verse 15 now, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If, this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, also uh, by, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If every man in his own order, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even uh, to even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority. Uh, so we'll all, let me read that one more time. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy shall, uh, that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did, did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else... What shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy at, at every hour? 
I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought the, with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it, is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In verse 35, the body, talking about the body which is raised, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear, but bear grain. It may, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, and another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such as are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now that's a lot of, lot of words there, but we're going to hit, hit it pretty hard here, and we're going to figure out just what... God's Word is talking about here. I read that through because you have to kind of read it through for it all to come together. Because what Paul is saying, now there were some people that were teaching, teaching that there is no resurrection in the day of, uh, of Paul. And in that day back then, they were teaching that there is no resurrection. That today is all we have. And that if you die, there is no eternity there, you know, what you have here is all there is. That's what they were teaching. Does anybody know who was teaching that? That was a set of the religious leaders of the day. Sauces. Who? Sauces. The Sadducees, right. And the way to remember who that was is this. Does anybody remember? Sadducees. They're sad, you see. You Sadducees. They're sad. Because they have every reason to be sad if they don't believe in the resurrection. If they think this is all there is, if life is all they've got and there is no eternity, where is the dead? Where are those that went on before us? What a terrible, miserable thing it would be to just live in this life and not have anything else. Because let me tell you, I don't know if you figured it out or not, 
But this life is not all a bed of roses, right? I'm glad there's an eternity and that we have everlasting life, those of you and I that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, as forgiveness for our sins, ask Him to come into our heart and proclaim Him as our Lord and Savior. By for, forgive, for asking forgiveness, asking Him to come into our heart, and then professing Him, yes, Lord, I believe. And like, like one man said, he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Listen, sometimes even right up to the point of salvation, Satan will be working at us to try to keep us from believing. Why? Because he knows that he'll lose our souls if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That he won't have a call and a hold on our souls. The Spirit goes back to whom when we die? God who gave it. That's right. And the body goes back to... Go ahead, to the earth from whence it came. So God's word says that we go back, the body goes back to dust or the dust of the earth. Like the one little boy said, Dad, is it true that the body goes back to dust when we die? He said, Son, that's right. That's what the Bible says. He said, There's either somebody coming or going under my bed then. <laughs> I can relate to that. You know, as a kid, you get under there, you, you're going to look around. And, oh, sometimes, you know, who thinks to... Who thinks to sweep under the bed all the time, right? Or to dust under the bed. But I'm just saying that the Sadducees, that was, that's not the only group that there ever was of people, that there ever were of people that did not want to believe in Jesus Christ. There were others too that thought they could live today, live, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It even says that. Paul had heard that. So he was saying, those of you that want to believe that all you have to do is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, you're misled. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what Paul was saying. Because there is an eternity. If you're earthy, if, you, you're, if you're of this earth, then you are a human. And, and whether you believe it or not, there is an eternity. God's Word tells us that. There is a heaven and there is a hell. Did you know God's Word talks more about hell? than it does heaven. I can see why, can't you? I think people need to be shook up a little bit every once in a while to know that there's a terrible place that we need to avoid. And Jesus Christ can help us to do that by having eternal life and being able to realize that this world is not all there is. And if you're out there today, whether live stream or you're out here in person listening to our Bible study, you know you're of all men, Paul said, most miserable if you think that all there is is this life, you're miserable. You know, because there are people that have already died and gone that you, you were close to. Maybe family or grandparents or, or friends that some of them that you knew were Christians. And you, you know now, according to God's word, they went on to be with the Father. Their spirits went on. One day we'll all have an eternal body. But right now the spirit has to go someplace. And so, of course, it goes on. The Spirit goes on to be with the Father. Paul said it this way. Does anybody know the verse that Paul stated about where the body goes? To be absent from the body is to be... Somebody finish it. Present with the Lord. That's quite right, Richard. This is Richard Robbins, of course, and this is Terry Brandon. I'm so glad to have them here. They have been so good to fill in for me with my many trips to the James Center weeks that I've had to be gone, and so on. By the way, we've got another trip coming up on Monday. Carlene has a special, a special trip to go to also there at, in Columbus, not at the James Center, but it's around that general area. And uh, it's about the, the aneurysm that, she, that they detected that she has. And that uh, also um, she has possibly had a stroke, and they just want to check her out and make sure the neurosurgeon has to do that to see what he can find out about that. Now, she acts pretty normal to me right now, you know, but if they found something they need to check further, we want to know about it, right? And so that's what they're going to do. So we'll be going Monday then and uh, getting that taken care of. But I'm just, it just makes me feel good to know that there are two qualified men that are willing to step in and able to step in when I am gone. And I appreciate that, Richard and Jerry. I may not have told you often enough, but I do appreciate you both for being able to do that. All right, now, 
Let's look at this, the necessity of our resurrection. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you, uh, some among you, that there be no resurrection of the dead? This is what we're talking about. The Sadducees spread that little rumor that there, there is no resurrection of the dead. Then it goes on to say, he goes on and tears this thing apart and helps us to understand there's got to be a resurrection. Because if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is vain, also vain. So our lives, knowing the Lord and doing things for the Lord, is all vanity. That means it comes to nothing. It's, it's all just for, for no motive at all. But if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he, that he raised up Christ from the dead. That he raised up Christ, uh, then, that he did not raise up Christ uh, if it be so that the dead rise not. Verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and, and are, you are yet in your sins. You see, you see the snowball effect that Paul is talking about right here? If you're going to follow that, str that stream of, uh, of uh, thinking that there is no Christ or that he is not risen, and then, then our, our faith is in vain. And that means Christ died in vain. And we've testified about God, and it's been in vain. And there's nothing good that's going to come from it then. And the, then what about the dead? Then they don't rise up. All those people, those loved ones that you know that said they went to be with God, that they wouldn't rise up, and they wouldn't be with God. Now, something's wrong with that kind of thinking, isn't there? You can see that that just doesn't add up according to God's word. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and yet you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, if you and I have only hope in Christ in this life, we're still miserable. Because this, this is not all there is. It's great that we know Salvation is great that we know Christ, but if we don't realize and if we don't preach that there is a resurrection, like the Sadducees wanted to preach that there is no resurrection, then we are of all men, verse 19 says, most miserable. It's a miserable thing, a miserable life that we would live, having no hope. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, but by man also came the resurrection of the dead. What man did death come by? By man came death. What man did death come by? Adam. Adam, that's right. The first man, death came by Adam. Of course, he blamed Eve. He said, well, that woman you gave me. You know what? When we do things like that, we are actually coming against God himself. So, of course, she said, well, that serpent made me do it. If you go back and read where God asked Adam, Adam first originally tried to blame God. So that woman that you gave, yep. she made me do it. So he was blaming God for Eve. Then he was blaming her, and he's not wanting to take responsibility. So when God addressed Eve, she didn't want to take responsibility. They're trying to distance themselves from their own personal sin. They were not accepting what they no, had done, they right? They didn't want to accept anything. <clears throat> no, they were not accepting at all responsibility for what they had done. Now, but isn't that kind of like our human nature? Don't, I, don't I we was do that? Say it started in the beginning, and it's still going it's on. It's still going on, yeah. is it? We, we are we still... We have that difficulty of accepting responsibility. For sin. Sin. Right, or for the wrong action, right. which makes sin, which causes sin. You and I, just we, we came by this, let's just say we came by it honestly, from that first man. Well, you say it's in the genes. It, in the genes, that's right. It, it really is in our human nature. It's in our makeup. But we can't leave that alone, can we? Because we know that even though it's in our human makeup to... To not admit sin, to try to justify ourselves, and to try to push it off on somebody else and not accept responsibility. 
well, that woman you gave me, she's the reason I have sinned. And of course you say, well, that serpent in there, you know, in the garden, that's the reason I sinned. So it was passing the buck right from the start, wasn't it? Passing the buck. It's because you gave me that woman. Now, when God gave that woman to man, what did he say about that woman and that man? Did he say, this is a bad thing I made this man? No, he didn't say that. It's good. It's good that he made that man. It's good that he made this woman. He needed a woman because he needed a what? A help meet, right. A corn. Of course, I've got to tell you, why is it help meet instead of a help mate? Tell me the difference. Some of you know the difference. I've mentioned it before. What's the difference between a help meet and a help mate? What's a mate like? James, if you were my mate, how would you look? <laughs> if you were a mate, my mate. I mean, if you were a mate, if you were a mate to me. I have longer hair, maybe blonde. <laughs> You're right. See, you would look like a mate looks like something else. It's, uh, you know, two candlesticks that look like each other are a mate. you got two wheels on a car that are a mate. They're, they go together. They drive right together and so on. So when we're talking about a help meet, we're not talking about a help mate. The last person in the world I wanted to marry when I married Carlene was somebody like me. I didn't want to marry somebody like me. I wanted somebody that knew how to love, knew how to have joy, was exciting, and uh, somebody that was beautiful, not somebody that looked like me. I dated my third cousin by mistake. Down south. How's that? Wait, 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 wait. Huh? I'm from the south. Don't go there. What? I said, I'm from the south. Don't go there. Well, I've got to go there. Because <laughs> I'm from the north. I want you to there. It was an accident. It was an accident. I didn't know she was my third cousin. It's pretty good. <laughs> Premeditating carelessness. Well, there be, could be some truth in that. But the fact is, is that I didn't know she was my cousin. And after I had dated her, you know, it was just a date at the Burger Queen, you know. It was just a, an acquaintance where we had sat in fellowship and, and uh, me and other guys and with other girls from the college. We, we were just having a good time after a basketball game. It was fun, you know. But then I went home and I said, Granny? I met a girl named Terry, and she says that her grandfather lives over here in Tammy Holler, too. I said, do you know a family that lives over in Tammy, in Tammy Holler by her name? And she, she said, oh, yeah, I know. That would be your third cousin. I said, oh, no. So whenever I saw her again, I saw me with a wig on. You somehow, when somebody is related to you, somehow you can, and third cousin, you can see yourself in them. Do you think I wanted to marry somebody that looked like me with a wig on? I don't think so. I'm just saying, now, somebody, I think you, Katie, said, help meet. Now, the help meet is different from the help mate because they are different from us. So when you've got something different and it complements something else, what does it do? It completes, they complete each other. That's right. Is that what you said? No, no. Well, I was going to say that, you know, husband and wife will meet you halfway. They'll, They'll meet each other halfway. Yeah, if they meet halfway, the mm -hmm. two of them make a whole. The two of them make a whole. That's, that's a good way to say it. The two of them make a whole. So the fact is, you and I are glad that we have a help meet. Instead of the help mate. Now I say all that to say, look, let's just put it right where God was telling Adam, this is somebody that's a help meet to you because you need help. The dogs and the cats and the elephants and everything you've named, and he named them by the way, they didn't satisfy you. So he took a rib out of Adam and he made a woman out of her. So you might say that she somehow has human DNA then because of that and that she was able to complete Adam. So somehow we are kind of related, but not so related that we're like one another. We are not related in the fact that we are so much like one another that we're mates. We're not. Uh, Adam would have to argue with you on that. He, he knew he wasn't a mate to Eve because for one thing, 
She could persuade him to do things that he wouldn't have done himself. Right? I try food that Carlene tries because it's on her plate and it looks better. You know, I'm just saying that she causes me to try things that I would never have tried. And I help her to try things she wouldn't have tried. So together we complete one another. I'm just saying, you you and uh, James, Katie, you have completed one another. You continue. We never stop completing one another. We never do. So what you're saying is that she got you trying to please? Well, Carlene's, it's kind of her fault about those cookies. <laughs> because she she's always made cookies for me, and now I can't keep my hands off of them. Cookies. Mm -hmm. She makes those homemade cookies, and... Boy, I've learned how wonderful. I think they are one of the perfect foods. <laughs> cookies. They should be their own food group. You know? But anyway, uh, yes, cookies are very, very hard for me to resist. In fact, I opened the pack before I brought them to church tonight. Because I wanted cookies. But anyway, so as we look at this, we have to see, we have to see that here uh, God's word is telling us that Christ did raise from the grave. Our life is not in vain in Christ. We know that they which are fallen asleep in Christ have not perished. And we also know in verse 19, we are not miserable having hope only in this life. Because we've got hope in eternity in heaven because God's word says we have a home in heaven. John said that. He said uh, that he's given us, uh, he's, that we would have a mansion there. Jesus actually said that in John, in the book of John. And, uh, and we know that God's word says that he's gone to prepare a place for us, that where he is, there we may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that wonderful? See, we know that it's a solid thing. That we have a hope in something more than this life. And I have to tell you, if all I had hope in was going to work and coming home and getting something to eat and going to bed, that would be awful. You know, life is more than that. We've got Christ in our lives. He gives us a reason to live every day. To be able to touch other people's lives. Whether you work at the nursing home, whether you work with unruly kids like Terry does, unruly adults. Unruly kids. You know, I'm saying, you know, you've got people that you have learned to show God's love to, and God makes it all okay. Now, as we look at this, we are not miserable in this life. That we know that Christ is risen from the dead and from the first fruits of men that of them that slept. You so so we know that the first fruits of men was not was not a wonderful thing when you think about the sin. Now, so what was one of the consequences of sin then? Can you tell me what the consequences of sin? When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what were the consequences? Tell me a few. They what? They got thrown out. They got thrown out of the, of the garden of Eden. Because there was a tree in there besides the tree they ate of, which was they ate of the tree of, of knowledge of Good and evil. That's right. It wasn't just a tree of knowledge. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before then, man wasn't thinking like there was anything wrong at all. There, they couldn't. We couldn't see any wrong in life at all. Anything. Can you imagine that? Not seeing any wrong in your spouse. Not seeing any wrong in, in the place you work. Or in the friends that work with you. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. A wonderful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? The word of God, the love in the heart of that man, caused him to reach a whole generation of kids because, by the way, you didn't know it maybe? He was a preacher. He was a minister. Did you know that? Presbyterian. Presbyterian minister, that's right. And it was his love for children that caused him to do that show. That now lingers on and it will for generations. But I just say, you have to know that, the God, that God's love in our hearts gives us a new perspective on life. We don't see the evil that other people see. We see hope. Don't we see hope? 
You've got hope in me. I've got hope in you. I've got hope in this world. I've got hope in the place uh, that we have hope in the places we were because we know that God can persevere and God can help us overcome, be overcomers. So as we look at this, we don't have a hope in this life only because if we did, verse 19 says, we would be most miserable if that's all we had. But now Christ is risen. We know Christ has risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Those that, that fell asleep in the Lord, that by the way, that's how it refers to people that know the Lord, they have fallen asleep in the Lord. That doesn't mean they're sleeping in the grave while the worms are eating their bodies. That's not what that's talking about, by the way. James said it earlier. He said, well, when, when we die, the spirit doesn't stay in that body. The body starts to decay goes back to the dust from which it came. But the Spirit goes back to God who gave it. You see, it's important that we recognize that. So we know that one day we will get that body that's incorruptible. And God's Word says one, at one day our body will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That's what you saw in Katie's eye. When you looked at her with that love, you, and she looked back at you with love, James, it was that twinkle in her eye. That's what she saw in your eye, too, by the way. I remember. I remember when you first met, and you went to that 4th of July celebration, and oh, boy, I don't think you wanted anybody else to sit next to Katie, did you? Okay, you see, God's love grows. It grows, and the twinkling of an eye it's not the blink of an eye. It means the twinkling. It's just, it's just that fast. One of these days, just that fast, when Christ comes back, God's Word says, those that are dead in Christ already, those dead bodies that are in Christ already, those that come back with Jesus, He will be, bring the saints back with Him, and then those that are with that have been that died first will get their bodies how fast? In the twinkling of an eye. And then those which are alive will go on up to meet Jesus, too. So, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're looking, uh, we, we have waiting on us. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So, what does it mean there that since, since death came by Adam, what are some of the other things that came because of their sin in, in the garden. What else happened? Death. Death. We would not have physical death if it weren't for Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. By the way, it took a while for man to ruin things. I mean, even Adam and Eve's sin in the garden started us having to have death eventually. Who knows how old the oldest man was? How long did he live to be? How old? Who was it, by the way? You've heard that expression. Well, that person's as old as Methuselah. That's right. He was the oldest man. And he was, anybody know? What? Was it 900? And 969 years. Now, by the way, nobody has lived that long ever since. However, the years have diminished over time. Many think that have studied the scholars and so on think that because mankind has gotten worse and worse, then our bodies have been more and more susceptible to all the things that man has done so that life began. And if you'll notice, men begin to live shorter and shorter time periods. And by the time Christ came, God's word says that man was living to be three score and ten. How old is that? 70 years. Man, you think about 969 years, according, you know, versus 70 years, that's not very long, is it? But I like what Dorothy said, Carlene's friend that she used to care for. Dorothy West, my friend, too. She said, I don't know if anybody ought to live as old as I am. She was 90, at that time she was about 94, wasn't she? I think she died at 95. She said, I don't know if anybody should live. She said, when you live to be as old as I am, you've got more friends on the other side than you've got here. I, I can see that. And she said, and by, besides that, all this technology just passes you right by and you're just sitting there, not understanding it. That's why him by the phone to Zach or somebody who gives. Let, hey, you fix this thing, would you? TV's messed up. 
And I still remember when I used to go in and first thing Dad would do, here, he'd hand me the remote. The kids have messed up the programming on my videos, so I can't videotape all the preachers. Would you fix it? Oh, and by the way, the picture's not right. Would you go ahead and tune this VCR in? And, you know, I would think, I'm thinking, I come here and first thing I want them to do is fix things. Don't be surprised if I had some hand some of you my TV, my TV to work on or, you know, something else. Well, of course, I wouldn't hand you the TV now. They're too big. But, I mean, can you imagine? I guess maybe I'm getting a little bit older. I'm just guessing. Now, as we think about what else happened in the garden, what else did Adam and Eve mess up? What else had to happen then because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden? Some, another consequence. What? Painful childbirth. Hey, what? Painful childbirth. Pain in childbirth. That's right. I asked my wife the other day, I said, you know, I don't know why, but I just can't seem to remember all the birth dates. Sometimes I can get the day right and sometimes a month, or usually the month right, but I can't usually get the year right or maybe the day. And she, I said, how do you do that? She'll go down and tell me, I don't know. She said, because I was there and it was painful. <laughs> okay, let's not go there anymore. <laughs> That's how I understand. I won't bring that up anymore. But uh, And it's true. Because of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, there is pain in childbirth. You can thank Eve for that. Also, there's some other things. Man now creates something. Creates something when he works. It's called sweat. God's word said he would earn his living by the sweat on his body. So when you think about it, my wife used to say, I don't mind your sweat, it's clean sweat. Okay, I'll let you explain that to everybody when they get ready to leave. <laughs> Versus her brothers, whose sweat wasn't clean sweat. So I don't know, I'm not going there. I just, she, was, she had to be in love if she thought my sweat smelled okay. What? <laughs> Oh, I'm getting some strange looks up here. There's some biology to that, so. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's good biology, right? Yeah. Depends. Okay. <laughs> it depends. All right, we won't go there. So, there was something else that Adam and Eve missed out that was in the Garden of Eden because they were ran out. There was something else there. Separation from God and it cost him. Well, I didn't even think about that one, but separation from God is one of them because of their sin. And God had to make them something to wear because they needed clothing, because they discovered, because of the knowledge of good and evil, they discovered that they were naked. They didn't know that before. What? It cost his son. It what? It cost his son. And it cost God his son because a sacrifice had already started now. An animal had to be killed to make them the correct kind of covering instead of a fig leaf. Something else. He yeah. also cursed the ground. And God cursed the ground. Therefore, we've got that sweat that we have to earn our living by. And there are thorns. And there are other things. Satan is a devourer, by the way. He will do what he can to make everything more miserable for us. And work can sometimes, I'm just saying, be kind of miserable every once in a while, okay? It, I'm just saying, that's, that's because Adam and Eve messed up in the garden. So they got ran out of the garden. They, for, forever after that, there had to be a blood sacrifice to make us acceptable before God, to hide our nakedness and our shame. Thank you for that. That was very good, Ernie. Now, God had to kill something to cover us. He would eventually have to kill, have his own son. Of course, Satan would do that. But he had to allow his own son to be killed on our behalf, Jesus Christ. Yes. So that's how the sacrifices started? That's how they started. After, right after there. After how they started. Right there is when they started. Now, ever after that, God required a blood sacrifice because it was looking forward. That blood sacrifice was looking forward. We had to have faith to know that one day... There would be a blood sacrifice that would suffice that all the other blood sacrifices would remind us of. And we'd have faith to give blood sacrifices in the Old Testament days. Looking forward to whom? The coming of 
Jesus Christ, the full, only, acceptable sacrifice. So all these others were given, were given in faith that the blood was going to cover our sin. Yes, Richard. And that's all it could be was cover the sin. It couldn't forgive sin. It was only there as a sacrificial covenant. Yes. Thank you for that, Richard. Pointing out that no sacrifices, the blood sacrifice itself, could not forgive sin. All it did was cover sin, and God forgave sin by accepting that blood sacrifice in lieu of having that acceptable sacrifice, which would eventually be Jesus Christ, the Savior. So, somebody asked a question a while back. How then did Moses and Abraham and all those, if Jesus had not come yet, how did they have an acceptable sacrifice if Jesus had not come? How did they have it? Because they had faith in that blood sacrifice that it was a representation of the knowledge that one day an acceptable blood sacrifice would not only cover that sin, it would actually forgive that sin, make it forgiven, able to be forgiven, because that's what God was going to do with His only begotten Son. Does that make sense? They gave their sacrifices in hope that Jesus Christ would come. We give our bodies and our faith knowing that Christ has come. So if anybody has that question, you can tell them, this is what it means. That's representative of the blood sacrifice that was going to come that God would accept, that would be able to forgive. We could be forgiven by that blood sacrifice because of Jesus Christ. We look back to what Christ has done on the cross. They look forward to what Christ was going to do on the cross as the Christ. Yes? There was one thing I wanted to bring out. Was that um, when God talked to Adam, he said, I placed before you life and death, choose life. Just like a teacher when you were in school, We'll give you an open book test. Here's the questions. Here's the book. Go and find the answer. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a choice to make, and we have we can do whatever we want. The choice is ours. But there are consequences. There's immediate consequences, short-term consequences, <coughs> and long-term consequences. Okay. The immediate consequences for Adam and Eve were separation. From God at that point, mm -hmm. expulsion from the garden, um, short-term consequences. Now Adam has to work. There's pain in childbirth, da, 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 mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. The long-term consequences is that they both physically die at some point. Spiritual death immediate. And there's a separation. Right. So we all, I mean, everybody can do whatever they want. We just have the immediate, short-term, and long-term consequences. Which we cannot dictate. Amen. That God isn't that only, well said. God only writes the rule book, but God also plays by the very same rules. He doesn't say, do what I say. He says, do as I do. He gave you an example through Jesus Christ. And one of the things we're talking about here back in verse 14, and I don't mean to backtrack, That's but right. where he was talking about, um, and if Christ be not risen, then there's our preaching vain. When looking up the word vain, it means to be foolish or silly. Okay? So, if Christ is a rhythm, then our preaching is, is foolishness. It makes no sense. Okay? But your faith is also vain. Okay? So there's two different versions of the same word. Your faith is also foolish. It's not resulting according to marriage without success or result. So your faith is not going to have what you're looking for if it's not well founded. The preaching of the cross to those that perish is foolishness. So if I'm explaining to you what the cross means and it makes no sense, guess what? You're perishing. Mm -hmm. And that should set off alarm bells. But again, that is your choice. But Full, have a full understanding of what you're getting involved in. And I think God helps us to fully understand it's, it. That's, exactly. I love that. That's very well said. I really like that. See, aren't you glad there's more than one person up here? See, this is what I'm talking about. 
and uh, that we can get the help that we need. Now, so see, I like the fact that you mentioned the short-term or immediate short-term and long-term consequences. There's another short-term consequence or immediate consequence right away that was done in that Garden of Eden, that was experienced in that Garden of Eden, that had long-term consequences. Remember, they were ran out of that garden. They were ran, they were run out of that garden. Separation from God. Exactly. The separation from God, which was also because they did not have access now to another kind of tree that was in the garden. The tree of life. You see, now spiritually, spiritually, they were going to die. They were going to die spiritually and physically. That's what happened when they left that garden because now they did not have access to the tree of life. It's no wonder that God put a guard at the gate of the garden. And who was that guard? Does anybody know what type of being? A what? An angel. And what was that angel holding? A sword. Let me tell you what. If you see an angel holding a sword, don't go there. A flaming sword. Yes. We're talking about God sealing that entrance with one of his mighty angels with a flaming sword. But think about this. Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. Okay. And... God had told them, do not eat of it. Had they eaten of the other tree on top of that, then you were looking at eternal sin. That's true. Now they, well, which, you know, we've already got an eternal being that's a hateful, sinful liar, and the father of lies, a serpent, and that's Satan. He, God did not need any other beings that were eternally his enemy. Now, so, but that wasn't going to happen because God was not going to allow Adam and Eve to eat of that tree of life. Now, however, in, in heaven, we are going to be able to take of the tree of life. It's an eternal thing that we'll have eternal life and we receive that eternal life when we accept Jesus Christ our Savior. When we go to heaven, we'll have fruit that is not of this world. Believe me. So, but when we think of this, uh, they, they went ahead and, and, and it says here that sin came by the first man, the earthly man, which was Adam. Then it says here, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So who was the second man? That was Jesus. Jesus. How can we say he was the second man that we would have eternal life? How, does that, how did that happen? Do you, do you know? Do you remember? How did that happen? That God allowed us to have that second man by whom eternal life would be given. And that happened when? You just know what? Cross. It happened at the cross. He gave his life for us, yes. But he became that second man, God as a second man. Right, right. You're getting there, but when did he become, when did God become man and live among us? At the birth of Jesus Christ, Bethlehem. That's what that birth was all about, was that God became man. By the way, that's what the name of Christ, Emmanuel, the name of Christ Emmanuel means. God among us. And that's what that name Emmanuel means. So, he is among us. He was among us. He lived among us. He died on the cross. And as a man, he died on the cross. But he rose victorious as the man, the, the son of God. But being a man and living among us causes him to be able. He said he knows, he has known temptation like as we do. He's been tempted in all ways like as we have. So he knows what it means to be tempted. He knows what it means to have to die. He knows what it means to be tormented, to be hurt, to be physically injured and actually terminally injured. This is Christ. He knows. 
So if you've got something going on, you can turn to Christ and he can now be your knowledgeable intercessor. That's right. Your knowledgeable intercessor that knows exactly what's going on in our minds and our hearts and our bodies and spiritually, emotionally. He knows what we're going through. Now that's a terrible thing to have for him to have to do so that he could be the God-man that would be crucified but raised victorious over death, hell, and the grave. But that's what it took. And that's the kind of Savior we have that can understand just what we're going through. So all the things that happened because Adam and Eve got forbidden to come back into the Garden of Eden. It's a lot of things that happened right there. And I like the way you put it. Immediate uh, consequences, short term and long term. You were going to say something else? Richard. Well, yeah, um, we were talking about Christ being the, the second, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, but every man in his own order, Christ is the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ and his coming, right? But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Yeah. Okay. So when we look at Christ being the Messiah, or Yoshida, right? Being the icon or standard, Son of God, he is God's standard. Now, you have a cell phone, I've got one, and anybody who has a computer knows that when you click on email or the internet, whatever, it takes you to your email or your internet. You click on that icon. That's your standard. Jesus was God's standard. This is what he set in place. Adam was supposed to be the first standard, but he failed. So God himself, not just himself of eternity, stepped down into time and space, confined himself into a physical form mm -hmm. of the body of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he set the standard. He is, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. It's the only way. Exactly. The only of way. All the, of all the plans that God can come up with in the universe in order to redeem the soul of man, I will do it myself. I'm not going to send the angels to do it. I'm not going to just wipe the slate clean and start over again. I will do it myself. I will take the punishment. I will be the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. Just place your faith and trust me and I will take care of it. Who else could have done it? That's what I'm saying. Right. God had to become man that he could correct you and I because we were going to go astray and we did go astray and he had to take care of it. I mean he didn't have to but he loved us that much. That's, that's why you have Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for mankind. You don't have a sheep, you don't have a bull, you don't have a dove or whatever. It took a human to be the ultimate sacrifice for humankind, for mankind. Mm -hmm. so that's what Makes good sense. James? Yeah, um, is that why Abraham wasn't allowed to go to heaven and sacrifice his son? What was that now? Is that the reason why Abraham wasn't allowed, <coughs> wasn't permitted to sacrifice his own son because of Jesus? Was he going to be the ultimate sacrifice or he just there wasn't? Because there, there was going to be a sacrifice, and it was the right one. But that, that was just a test of his faith. Because if we put anything, I mean, all he wanted in life, he had been promised that he would have a seed that would follow him, that would be the inheritor of everything he had. All he wanted to see was that son. And then something happened. God, something happened. His life began to be... All about having that son. And he got so involved physically, mentally, emotionally in having that son. He and Sarah worked up that situation where he would take her maidservant and have Ishmael, Hagar. He would take that maidservant, Hagar, and have Ishmael. So he was actually intimately involved in trying to make that work. Well, you know as well as I do, when we try to make God's work plan, we make, uh, make it our plan, we mess it up. And he did mess it up. Now you think, well, he eventually had Isaac by Sarah, even though she was something like 90-something years old. So was he. But 
Think of the mess that caused. If you remember, Ishmael is the forefather of all of these people over there in Iraq, Iran, in that area. There will never be peace. We're still fighting that fight because he was terribly jealous of Isaac, and so was she. But God did say to Hagar, he will be the father of a nation. Yeah, he'll be the father of a people. You know, that's something that God, he don't expect us to do the same thing that he would do for himself. Or if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. right. He will give his own son, but he doesn't expect us to. No, he, he wouldn't expect us to try to sacrifice our son. Abraham wasn't expected to sacrifice his son. He was just expected to be willing to because he was putting that son, the idea of having a son, in front of everything else in his life instead of his faith in God to let God do whatever he wanted to do. So in his eyes and in his mind, he was saying, okay, Father, I know you're big enough to make this plan of yours work. If you want me to... I will sacrifice this son if you want me to. An angel stayed his hand because that really wasn't what God wanted. He didn't want Adam to kill or Abraham to kill his own son. He wanted him to be willing to sacrifice his life, his life, and his way to do God's thing, to do it God's way. The, the, the son was not going to die. No. Yeah, go ahead. What's, what's the first of the commandments? Love, love, love the, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, strength, and soul. What Jesus said, right. the most That's important the greatest commandment. The greatest what commandment. Is, what is the first of the commandments? Love thy God. What are you talking about? Love right? the Lord thy God that shall have no other God before me. Oh, yeah. So anything you put between you and God is considered an idol. Yes. So in this case, the child, God wanted to find out. Okay? Sarah and Abraham, they're, they're focusing on this child. So do you think that any of us could put anything between us and God. That's what God tells us not to do. See, now that's... We're to love, love him more than I love my wife, more than she loves me, more than we love our children. And even Jesus said that your love for God should be so great that your love for your parents should look like me. It says that. It does. So, in comparison... In comparison... Anything that comes between you and God, whether it's a job whether it's a child, whether it's a house, a spouse, whatever, is considered an honor. Let's put that in perspective here. Because we're going to say, uh, uh, young marriages, one thing we have to really learn in true love in real marriages that God has put together is that we have to be willing to love one another, God first, and love one another in God's love. Which means... We have to love them the way God would want us to love them. We must put God first or everything starts spinning out of control. Like the Sermon Sunday, circumspectly we have to live. With Christ at the center, if we don't, we're going to mess it up. So let's love our wives as God loved. In fact, God's Word says, uh, love your wife as Christ loved the church and died for the church. What, what does love mean? What does love mean? Love is not listening to a love song or watching a Hallmark movie. It is See? doing for the other person in spite of how they feel. Giving of yourself for their benefit, for their good, in spite of how they feel, in spite of how they treat you. Look at what they did to Jesus. Look at what they did to Paul. Look what they did to Stephen. Stoned, beating, abused, mocked, crucified. See, now that is a very good principle. You, if you want to know what real love can be and how real love can forgive, read the book of Hosea where his wife became a harlot and went out and went haywire and he bought her back and brought her right back as his wife. Now you've got to read that because... That's a love that God you wanted to use from Hosea's life and his wife. Just that's what and he what he was saying was, and Hosea is getting us across, getting this across for us, is that God loved the church and Israel so much that he was willing to bring her back 
just like Hosea brought his harlot wife back. Because sometimes as God's people, we look like harlots because we go astray. And God has to bring us back. Maybe he has to buy us back like Hosea did. He has to pay a price for us because of how we've messed up. <coughs> and it's been an expensive price that people pay when they get out of God's will. But God can bring it through his love. He can bring it. He has bought us back. Who, how did he buy us back? With Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. Right. So we better stop right there. This is, can I use your marker here? So where did we stop at? About 24? Yes. Okay. About 24 here. And we'll get back to 24 next time. And by the way, I just think this is a wonderful chapter. And, and you know, if you go to a funeral, I want you to know you're probably going to hear some of these things. And if you don't hear it in the message, you will probably hear it at the grave <coughs> time. As they talk about death, uh, cannot enter the kingdom, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We must become incorruptible. That's your, you're going to hear that. And you're going to hear where man, the, the spirit goes back to God who gave it, but the body goes back to the grave, so to the earth from which it came. These are very important <coughs> facts that we need to know about death and eternal life, spiritual life, right here, being right with God. So anyway, let's come to a close. Anybody got anything else to share? Terry? Richard, got anything else you want to share? Anybody else? Hey, you've been very good about interacting with us tonight. And I thank you for your time and patience and your interaction. Thank you so much. And you've all said some wonderful things. I couldn't tell you who said the most thing, important things because the fact is, is that Ernie just made, you made a great statement there where you talked about... Uh, being separated from God. That was probably the worst thing that happened to Adam and Eve right there. Then you think of that immediate circumstance right there. And then you're talking about long-term, short-term, long-term. These are wonderful things to understand. Well, we'll come to a close now. Um, and Terry, would you mind dismissing us in prayer? Okay. Heavenly Father, we have uh, learned so much tonight. We're only covering a, a short amount of uh, verses, Father. We just pray, Lord, that uh, what we've heard and um, what we are learning, Father, that you would keep those things in our hearts, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to use this to build our, our faith in you and know that Christ is risen for us. We've talked about salvation, resurrection. And, Father, we just also pray that you would keep us uh, safe and healthy, Father, as we depart tonight. Continue on with what you have in store for us tomorrow. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for putting up with us as we have to do these things to, to try to uh, have a warm area to meet in. Uh, Steve, whenever it's convenient for you, not necessarily tonight, or maybe we can take those batteries and put them in the one downstairs, at least get that one working so that everything don't freeze up. Well,